of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I am poor and merciful sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have been ever and and I am just to deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am part of the Lord for you, and sin is very eternal. And I give you a profoundness mercy to forsake the holy innocent of your sovereignty of your beloved Son of Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor person of the Lord. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all the persons. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now and forever. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? 
Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. On this Holy Trinity Sunday, we have the joy and privilege to confess our Christian faith in the words of the Athanasian Creed. We speak this responsibly verse by verse as printed out in our books. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this. That we worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in the Unity, neither confusing her persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. And of the Godhead of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is one, to the glory equal, the majesty go eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated, or three infants, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty. And yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made, nor created, nor begotten by any The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. Thus, there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after the Lord, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus of all truth. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right of faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father. 
Father before all ages. And he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. The perfect God and the perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one in Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by the condition of substance, but by the unity of the person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again in the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And at his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal life. And this is the path of faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. And you may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day.
saying, Holy God, we praise thy name, is a hymnic version of an ancient hymn called the Te Deum. The Te Deum is Christianity's oldest hymn and best known hymn that is directly toward the Holy Spirit and to Christ as our Redeemer. It's been used in the liturgy in the Christian church, primarily in the Western part of the world, since at least the 6th century, so the 500s. And by that time, it was already considered a classic. In our hymnal, the Lutheran service book alone, service book alone there's, there's five versions of this hymn. And the one that we sing today, again, it's commonly called the German Te Deum. And it was translated from the original Latin into German by a German priest in the 1700s. And it quickly became, for most Christians in Germany, it became really the favorite version of this hymn. In the mid-1800s, it was translated into English, and then, for our sake as Lutherans, it came over, both in the German as well as into the English version, as Germans started to come more and more into the United States in the mid-1800s. So this is a song that God's people have been singing for a very long time. And as far as the Te Deum itself goes... The origins are a little bit mysterious, and there's a lot of different theories, but probably the most exciting possibility is that this was authored by St. Ambrose upon the event of St. Augustine's baptism, which would have been on April 24th or 25th in the year 387. Now, regardless if this is true or not, for at least 1,600 years now, Christians have been singing this. And by the time of the Reformation, Luther, as well as a lot of the other Reformers, actually stated that this ranks next to the Apostles and the Nicene Creed in terms of its qualities and the clear and concise statements of faith about the Trinity and about Jesus. So I want to take just a couple of minutes now just to look at this hymn in particular. It starts in heaven with this unending praise of the cherubim and the seraphim building upon this passage of Isaiah chapter 6, which we heard today in the Old Testament reading. It's the angelic song of the saints. This song is a song that we're going to be singing in heaven. It's the angelic heavenly song for all eternity that praises the one who brings salvation. And so we sing this in that eager anticipation of that time when we're going to be joined together with that heavenly church and all of the angels and we sing this in the very presence of God. We also have a little portion of this as well that we typically sing in our liturgies called the Sanctus as well. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God of hosts, or Lord God of Sabbath. We're going to sing it today as well. We normally sing this right before we get to the service of communion. And in here, we're singing to God, taking again these words from Isaiah 6. This isn't just any reference to God, but this is like the general. This is General Yahweh of the heavenly armies. That's what the host is. That's what the Sabbath means. So this isn't the lovey-dovey, gentle, caring God. This is the one who comes to conquer. To conquer all of his enemies of sin, of death, the devil, and all of the evil that exists in the world. Now God himself comes. And so when we see this thing, Right before we celebrate communion, we join our voices, and we say this, right, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven to laud and magnify God's glorious name. So the Te Deum 
latches on to this kind of language as well. It does the exact same thing, and then it moves from that heavenly picture and vision down to earth. And it moves to that historic incarnation of the very Son of God, that Jesus himself becomes man. That's how he brings the salvation to us. And in the last few verses, it concludes with us, God's people, asking God to spare, to keep, and to remain with us. Not just here in time, but also there into eternity. And then it ends with this verse of doxology, of praise to the Trinity. And that's why you stood on that last verse, right? Why we have the little triangle. Because it's a reference to the Trinity in that hymn of praise that we give to it. So, in this hymn that we just sang, maybe written by Ambrose on the occasion of the baptism of Augustine, we actually have a reflection of all of the scripture readings and even our theme for today as well. From Isaiah chapter 6 in Sanctus to Romans 11 and a phrase of doxology and praise to God and then to John chapter 3 where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about the new birth which takes place by the water and the spirit when the triune name of God is placed upon a person as the waters of baptism are poured out upon them. So let's move now a little bit to John chapter 3 of what we just sang about this very familiar passage in conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus ending for us today in, in one of the most famous verses of the entire Bible. John 3, 16, 17. And all of this takes place within that context of how Jesus is speaking of the new birth which comes in baptism. Baptism, the way that salvation that we sing about in the Te Deum is poured out and how the life of Christ now comes in and enlivens a person. This is why the historic Christian belief is that a person becomes a Christian when they're baptized because that's when the name of the triune God is given to that person. That's the final stamp of approval and the adoption as sons of God. That's why it's so important. That's why we celebrate it so much. And that's why we're reminded of it all of the time. That in baptism, that old man is regenerated and a new man in Christ is born. And that's why we begin our church service in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder of our baptism, of our identity, in why we are here, and whose we are, and who we belong to. It's a reminder of that, that by this saving act of God, that as God has lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, and gives out new life from above by water and the Spirit, he shows his love to a sinful and a fallen world, someone who is dead in their trespasses and sin. Boy, do we ever see the results of that now. We see the evil that exists in sin, the fallenness, the brokenness of the world. We have disease and death, murder and riots, division and disunity. This is the fallen world that God loves. This is the fallen world that God sent Jesus into so that he would become a man and die for our salvation. So when we look around at the world and the mess that we create, we say, what is God doing about this? Jesus is the answer to that. God sends his son to die for this fallen creation. God sends His Son so that Christ would be lifted up for all to see and all to believe, and that by believing that we might have life, eternal life, in His name. This is, this is how St. John says, God loves the world, right? The whole world. And that means that by Jesus being lifted up on the cross, by His all atoning sacrifice and His death, upon the, that very cross that he shows that every single person in the world whoever has lived, whoever will live 
no matter the quality of their life, no matter the length of their life, all of these matter to God. From the very moment of conception to the moment of natural death and even all the way into eternity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever, that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What that means for us is that our identity, a person's identity, is shaped by the triune God. It's not primarily shaped by the color of skin, by the language that we may speak, by nationality, by where we've been or where we're going, or how many sins we might commit. But that our primary identity is found in relationship to God, and that doesn't mean that all these other things don't matter, because they do. But the most important thing, the primary thing is, in, is who you are in regards to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The God who saves. So when we see all these things going on in the world, when violent riots and crime and evil, and we look at people and we wonder, how in the world can people do this sort of thing? How can they be so different? Or maybe... It's a little closer to home. How can someone who's so similar to you do something so different? The reason, the reason for all of this is the same reason that you sit in thought, word, and deed. By what you've done and by what you have left undone. It's because not just is the world sinful and broken, but so are you. And it's Jesus. Jesus only that's the answer that plagues our sinful and our broken world because only Jesus saves. Only Jesus reconciles. Only Jesus enlightens. And only Jesus deals with the root problem. Whether it's the problem in our own lives and households or the broader problems of society, it's only Jesus who reforms, and he reforms into his image. In the waters of baptism, in the new birth by water in the spirit, by the power of his word, by the very body and blood that is given to you for the forgiveness of your sins. And so Jesus, as he looks into this fallen world, and therefore, as you who bear Jesus' name and following his lead, care primarily about a person's soul, about their eternal life. We care that people are dead in their trespasses and sins. And that life, true life, eternal life, comes from the birthing from above, which is the work of God alone. So when we look at one another, we view people as individuals for whom Jesus has died. We see things on TV. We see things in our lives. We look at our children, at our parents. And we should think this is a person for whom God sent his son into the world to save. To be born again by water and the spirit to have the very life of Jesus Himself, This is a person who Jesus wishes to gather to himself for all of eternity. And when we start to view people in the world in that sort of light, it now shapes our own love, our own life, our service, our attitude, our slowness to anger, our quickness to forgive. For God loves them. Because God loves even you. How do you know? Because of that one simple verse. That God so loves the world. That he gave his only begotten son. For you. That whoever would believe in him should not perish. But have eternal life. Whoever would believe whether with a strong or a weak faith. That your worthiness does not depend on your greatness or your smallness. Nor the depths of your sin nor your righteousness in the eyes of the world. But it's all about Jesus and the life of Christ which he gives you today. So in the name of the Father,
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This life is yours. I invite you now to please rise as we sing our offering. Give thanks to you, holy Lord. 
Lord, Almighty Father everlasting, who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord. In the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty and holy. Therefore, the angels and our and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify our glorious name, evermore praising you and sing.
Please rise. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus strengthen and preserve you in body and in soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace.
may be seated. Before we get to our announcements today, we do have um, a special prayer and blessing that we are going to be giving for a child of our con congregation. Anya, would you please come all the way up front? Anya has uh, just graduated from Nampa Christian High School and are going to be attending it's in Northern Arizona. Northern Arizona University in the fall. And so we give thanks to God for his grace and mercy to her and that she's part of our family here. She will be going away for a while, but coming back to visit as well. So uh, as she heads on her way, uh, let's say a brief, uh, a brief prayer asking the Lord's blessing. So let's pray. Lord, you are gracious and merciful, and you watch over even the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, and you uphold everything with your everlasting arms. We ask you today, O oh Lord, to continue to protect and keep on you while she goes away to attend college this fall. Watch over her so that no evil would come to her during this time of separation. Keep her faithful to your word and your church. Guard and protect her as she is tempted by the evils and the sinfulness of this world. Keep her pure in heart, clean in mind, and healthy in body. Dwell with her day by day and abide with her and abide with all of us who remain here. Continue to grant us all, O oh Lord, your grace and your mercy. To the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, Anna, the Lord bless you as you continue on in this new adventure in your life and keep you steadfast in that your faith to life eternal. We will have a chance to, uh, to greet Anya and say congratulations. And if you'd like to visit with her a little more, uh, we are able to do that. We do over here in Luther Hall have a cake set up for her. There's a gift over there for you as well that we will give to you in just a moment. Um, our tables are spread out over there as well. And it looks like the weather is nice enough so we can, if you'd like, just like last week, we met um, um, under the walkway out over here, so you're welcome to go outside and enjoy the weather as well. Okay. Please come and say congratulations and wish God's blessings upon her as well. We have a gift, the gift right now. Yes. This is, uh, this is a gift from your church family and also my mother and to make sure that you read this in your business. Thank you. Let's get her. Okay, just a, a, a couple of brief ones um, here. Just for most everything, just look into um, the bulletin. But um, I would like to thank you who participated in the survey that was sent out this last week to give us a little more um, gauge and interest and feelings of the congregation as well. And um, to, to just reiterate that the elders and I are in regular conversation about church services, um, Sunday school and Bible study, and other, um, other studies and events and things that are happening here at the church. And as things um, continue to go, we will um, we'll try to communicate the best we can to the congregation if there's any change in service times, um, if, we, if we feel that it's, it's needed to go back to two services to spread out a little more, um, as well as the beginning of Sunday school and Bible study and those sorts of things as well. So, um, again, the elders and I are in conversation about this regularly, and we will keep you all updated to the best of our ability. If, for some reason, if you're not getting our emails that we send out every week, or um, you know someone who might like um, or enjoy that, please let me know um, so that we can make sure we have the correct email address um, for you, so 
Um, we want to make sure that that communication is available for everyone. Now, um, last week we, uh, we dismissed row by row, um, and so we'd like to continue to do that um, again a little bit as well. And so, uh, have a blessed day in the morning.